All right, good afternoon. Um, so welcome to our Burke Center of Environmental Law event this evening. We are really excited um, to have our speaker here. And I know there are also books that are out in the atrium if you're interested. I do believe we'll have them for a little longer. Um, I'll apologize. Um, I am going to be one of those people who gets to watch this um, in the recording format since I have to scoot out. But it promises to be a really fantastic lecture. And I'm going to hand it over to our center director, Jonathan Adler, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. As Jessica mentioned, I'm Jonathan Adler, and I have the privilege of being the founding director of the Coleman P. Burke Center for Environmental Law, which I think, as many of you know, was founded here at the law school in 2019 uh, with a $10 million gift from our late alum, Coley Burke. Uh, and it's his support and the support of his family that makes programs like this possible. Just so folks are aware, we sponsor a range of events, both in person and online. Tomorrow, we're hosting a webinar previewing the Supreme Court case Sackett versus United States. That's at 4.30. Uh, that's, you can watch that at, uh, on the website. Uh, we're doing an event a week from today on climate litigation in connection with the university's Climate Action Week and their other programs featured on the website. Today, uh, we're fortunate uh, to have with us Professor Tom Merrill of Columbia Law School uh, to talk about a very current, uh, I was going to say enduring subject, but perhaps that, that, that's a question to be answered by uh, the talk um, of the Chevron Doctrine. Um, uh, professor Merrill is the Charles Evan Hughes Professor of Law at Columbia. He's previously taught at Yale and Northwestern. Uh, he is one of the most cited legal scholars, not only in administrative law, but also in constitutional law and property law. Uh, in fact, uh, both Professor Nard and I use his property law casebook uh, in the 1L property class. He clerked for Chief Judge David Bazelon on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, for Justice Harry Blackmun on the Supreme Court. He was a Deputy Solicitor General uh, at the Department of Justice uh, and is currently the uh, co-reporter for the American Law Institute's Restatement Forth of Property, which though for those of us who teach property, we are very grateful that he's willing to put that work in um, because we know the restatement needs, needs some work and we look forward to, um, uh, to, to the fruits of those labors. Um, today, Tom's going to be talking with, to us about uh, the Chevron Doctrine, uh, based in part on his new book, which is available uh, for sale, and that uh, Tom will be happy to sign after, after the talk. The Chevron Doctrine, its rise, fall, and the future of the administrative state, uh, which was recently published by Harvard University Press. Uh, since you're all here, you all understand uh, this is not only an important topic for the subject of administrative law, but a particularly current one, as there certainly are questions uh, about uh, the, not only the past of the Chevron Doctrine, but uh, its present and its future, if it has one. Uh, you didn't come here to listen to me, so without any further ado, I'm happy to turn the podium over to Tom Merrill. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Uh, and it's wonderful to be here. I'm uh, always happy to uh, engage about uh, uh, administrative law and the Chevron Doctrine more specifically. Um, uh, when I, uh, I assume everybody knows what the Chevron Doctrine is, but just in case uh, that's not true, uh, uh, and, and, and it used to be when I would give talks about this, I would occasionally get lawyers saying, well, I think that's about Chevron versus Houston oil, Chevron oil versus Houston, right, which is about, you know, prospective overrulings or something like that. So uh, the Chevron Doctrine is the uh, administrative law doctrine uh, enunciated by the Supreme Court uh, over time, uh, uh, starting in 1984. Those, the breeziest way to summarize the doctrine is that um, uh, uh, when an agency interprets uh, an ambiguity or a, a gap in the statute that it administers uh, and does so in a reasonable fashion, the court uh, should give um, uh, either accept or at least give great deference to the agency's interpretation. Uh, a more technical uh, expression of the doctrine uh, is that uh, courts reviewing agency interpretations of statutes they administer should proceed in two steps. The first step is to ask whether or not Congress has clearly or unambiguously answered the precise question uh, that is before the court, in which case the court is obliged to enforce Congress's answer to that question. But if Congress has not unambiguously or clearly answered that question, then the question is whether, the second question is whether 
uh, the agency's interpretation is permissible or reasonable? And if the answer is yes, the court should accept or at least strongly defer to the agency's interpretation. So that's the Chevron doctrine. So why on earth would somebody want to write a whole book about the Chevron doctrine? Um, uh, the short answer, the real answer is that I was on sabbatical and COVID came along and so I had nothing else to do, so I wrote a book about the <laughs> Chevron doctrine. Uh, but I guess the more principled answer would be, um, it is the most cited uh, uh, case in all of administrative law by a significant margin. Um, indeed, it is one of the most cited cases in all of American law. I think it has surpassed Erie Railroad versus Tompkins uh, and um, uh, other uh, uh, important cases that you might think would be heavily uh, referenced. Uh, it, it has not reached Iqbal and Twombly, which of course are cited by district courts all the time for uh, on motions to dismiss, but Chevron is certainly the most important case in administrative law measured by citation counts. Um, uh, it's also controversial. It's been controversial from the beginning. Um, uh, Academics, I think it's safe to say, uh, in the early years were uh, skeptical about the Chevron Doctrine. They thought that it uh, uh, was too uh, simplistic, that it uh, overlooked a number of uh, variables that were important uh, and it should, could get lost uh, it, under this two-step approach to agency interpretations. Um, agency uh, lawyers, certainly, and lower court judges, I think, were more receptive uh, to the Chevron Doctrine, this very simplicity, I think, appealed to them uh, because it made it, uh, it much easier to deal with agency interpretations than the kind of multifactorial approach that had prevailed uh, in the years up to 1984. The doctrine is also, I think, uh, it's safe to say, at least uh, somewhat politically inflected. Uh, uh, when the doctrine really got started uh, in the um, late 80s uh, and into the early 90s and into the 90s, um, um, uh, the perception was that it was a conservative doctrine, that it was supported by uh, conservative uh, legal thinkers and conservative judges and was opposed by more progressive or left-leading uh, judges and, and uh, legal thinkers. Um, interestingly enough, uh, starting in about uh, the 2010s, or around 2015 or so forth, uh, uh, it flipped, uh, and Chevron became uh, bete noir to conservative judges and thinkers and was embraced uh, with some uh, degree of enthusiasm by progressive uh, thinkers and judges. Uh, so that's an interesting phenomenon, right? Um, uh, the arc, overall arc of the doctrine uh, uh, in over 35 years or so is, in fact, quite strange. Uh, uh, this made it interesting, to me at least. Uh, indeed, you could say it was bizarre. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, for that reason, it's called the Chevron Doctrine. The, doc the, the case was decided in 1984, but the doctrine continued to morph and be refined over time. And so uh, some of this uh, uh, bizarre evolution uh, is, uh, is very much part of what I was interested in. Um, uh, so the subtitle of the book, it, it starts out by talking about the rise and fall of the Chevron Doctrine. Let me say a few words about the rise of the Chevron Doctrine because this is one of the more curious aspects of this history. Um, it's quite clear that when Chevron was decided in 1984 that uh, either, neither Justice John Paul Stevens, who was the author of the opinion, uh, nor the court as a whole, had any intention whatsoever of issuing a landmark decision. Usually when you think of landmark cases, like Brown versus Board of Ed Education or Roe versus Wade or something like that, it's quite clear that the court is aware that it's rendering a decision of some uh, uh, major uh, significance. There's no sign that the court thought Chevron uh, was at all significant uh, in 1984. Uh, uh, Justice Stevens' opinion uh, was unusually long and detailed. It was 29 pages long with 41 footnotes, uh, but there was no indication uh, uh, that anything uh, strange or unusual was happening. None of the other justices that participated in the case, there were only six actually, it was a bare quorum. Uh, none of the other justices uh, in their memos at least, preserved in Justice Blackmun's uh, files, uh, raised any questions about the opinion or thought that anything uh, particularly uh, interesting uh, was happening. Um, there were some uh, what you might say unusual aspects of the opinion, uh, looking back at it retrospectively. Um, 
for the most part, I think it was a very conventional exercise in judicial review by Justice Stevens, uh, uh, and a quite a thorough one. It went through step by step, looking at the statute, the framework of the statute, the particular provision, the legislative history, the agency's course of decision making, and so forth. Um, but there were a couple of unusual aspects. There's a short introduction, part two of the opinion, uh, which um, uh, has uh, a sort of unusually snappy uh, uh, sort of uh, characterization of what courts should do when they're confronted with an agency interpretation of law. Uh, and that is the origins of this so-called two-step approach, which is now associated with the Chevron Doctrine. And toward the end of the opinion, Justice Stevens had a very interesting set of reflections about uh, how agencies are more accountable and have greater expertise than judges do. And so if you have an issue that turns out to be not really one that Congress has answered, but one that is an open question re requiring the balancing or resolution of competing policy interests, agencies are preferred interpreters in resolving those questions uh, rather than courts. So if Chevron, and Chevron was basically ignored by the court uh, uh, in the next year after it was decided, there were 19 cases the next year that involved some question about agency interpretations. Only one of them cited Chevron, uh, and that was um, uh, sort of in passing. Uh, so uh, how did the Chevron Doctrine get to be uh, a landmark decision? Well, the, the story is, and I think this is accurate, is that it was really created or it was treated as a landmark by the D.C. Circuit. So uh, three months after Chevron was decided, uh, the D.C. Circuit, uh, and an opinion by Judge Patricia Wald, uh, had an important end bank decision called General Motors versus uh, Environmental Protection Agency involving uh, the, uh, the period of time in which EPA could recall cars for failing to comply with uh, tailpipe emission standards. Uh, and Judge Wald uh, had a tough decision uh, in this case, it was an end bank decision, uh, because the panel uh, had basically said that EPA was violating uh, the plain meaning of the statute. Uh, she and the people that joined her wanted to uphold the EPA decision, and so she uh, reached out and uh, identified the Chevron decision, uh, which had been handed down at the end of the previous term by the Supreme Court, and characterized it as announcing a new standard of review for uh, reviewing agency questions of law. And she used uh, the two-step characterization in order to uphold uh, EPA uh, in that particular case. Uh, soon thereafter, the Chevron Doctrine takes off in the D.C. Circuit. It spreads like mopsy uh, gradually, but uh, in ineluctably among the various judges on the D.C. Circuit. Uh, and then it returns to the Supreme Court uh, when Antonin Scalia is elevated to the Supreme Court uh, in the fall of 1986. Uh, he was not a big cider or pr proponent of Chevron when he was on the D.C. Circuit, but once he joined the Supreme Court, uh, he took it upon himself to become uh, the champion of the D.C. Circuit's Chevron Doctrine, uh, announced uh, on the very first, one of the cases that was in the very first sitting of the Supreme Court in the fall of 1986, uh, that Justice Stevens had in fact misunderstood his own opinion uh, and that Justice Scalia was going to straighten him out, uh, <laughs> that in fact Chevron was an extremely important decision uh, that should be applied rigorously across the board. Um, uh, so. Justice Scalia's uh, advocacy of Chevron, I think, is an important uh, element uh, in explaining how this became uh, a landmark decision. Uh, the other part of the introduction said, uh, referred to the fall uh, of the Chevron Doctrine. The fall story is, in many respects, just as strange or bizarre as the rise aspect of the decision. Uh, the simple explanation for why Chevron uh, fell, if indeed it fell, uh, uh, is that um, uh, it lost the support of uh, conservative legal thinkers and judges. Uh, so in, in the early days, Chevron was seen as a conservative doctrine uh, and was uh, 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 vigorously uh, pr uh, promoted by Justice Scalia. But starting around 2015 or thereabouts, uh, 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 conservative judges and, and legal thinkers suddenly decided that Chevron uh, was bad news. Um, uh, the clearest illustration of this, perhaps, is Judge, Justice Clarence Thomas. Justice Clarence Thomas uh, had been a very staunch proponent of Chevron. He authored, among other things, a decision called Brand X, which went so far as to say that if an agency is eligible for Chevron deference, the agency can overturn judicial interpretations of statutes. Uh, 
uh, uh, that the agency administers. Um, uh, 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 but then in, in 2015, uh, Justice Thomas, uh, in a concurring opinion, announced that he now was, had uh, worries. He thought maybe Chevron was unconstitutional. Uh, so Clarence Thomas goes from a very enthusiastic proponent to somebody who thinks that Chevron probably should be overruled on constitutional grounds. Um, meanwhile, uh, liberal thinkers, uh, progressives, and judges uh, kind of migrated in the opposite direction. Uh, Elena Kagan wrote a lengthy article called Presidential Administration while she was at Harvard Law School before she became dean, uh, shortly after she uh, left the Clinton administration in which she valorized uh, the idea of presidents directing uh, uh, policy uh, through uh, various uh, pr pr pronouncements and statements, and the Chevron Doctrine played an important role in her conception of the role of the president as a policymaker uh, and supplementing or perhaps displacing Congress uh, in that role. In any event, um, once uh, President Trump was elected and managed to secure through various machinations, of which I'm sure you're all familiar, uh, three appointments to the Supreme Court, uh, this skepticism about Chevron uh, arrived uh, a big time uh, in the Supreme Court. Uh, at least the first two appointments, uh, Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh, were on record as being highly dubious about the Chevron doctrine. So their addition to the court, along with Clarence Thomas, one of his constitutional doubts and so forth, meant that the previous enthusiasm on the part of uh, conservative uh, justices uh, 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 disappeared. Now, um, uh, what would a political scientist say about this? The political scientists, of course, might say, well, this is easy to explain. Um, uh, during the rise of Chevron, the executive branch was controlled by President Reagan and pr the first President Bush, uh, and they had basically uh, large control of the agencies, and so the agencies were relatively conservative, and so judges and justices would prefer agencies to make policy rather than courts because a lot of the judges were still hanging around from earlier times um, and were quite liberal. And so therefore, if you didn't want liberal judges making policy, uh, deferring to agencies would be uh, a way to sort of uh, put some kind of damper on that. Um, and the second half of the explanation would be that um, uh, more recently, uh, particularly during the Obama administration, uh, when uh, the executive is controlled by a Democrat, a liberal, and the agencies are uh, significantly controlled by uh, uh, a Democrat, uh, that conservatives would suddenly decide that deferring to agencies is not such a good idea, that in fact you should have courts deciding these questions rather than agencies, and that, that might explain why the conservatives were pro-Chevron during one era and then become anti-Chevron in another era. It, it's not quite that simple, I think. It's, uh, they're more, it's more puzzling than that. Uh, uh, one puzzle is that uh, during the, two, the eight years of President Clinton's administration, uh, the conservative judges and justices continued their strong support for Chevron, notwithstanding that you had a Democratic president. Uh, another puzzle is that once uh, Donald Trump became president uh, and had uh, significant control over the agencies, uh, the conservatives remained opposed to Chevron as they had been during the Obama presidency. So I don't think there's a kind of one-to-one -one correlation that the political scientists might advance between whoever's president and who's controlling the executive branch and what the uh, judges think about uh, the Chevron doctrine. A um, couple of more specific reasons why the conservatives lost uh, uh, their taste for uh, the Chevron doctrine. Uh, uh, one, I think, that can't be uh, um, uh, discounted uh, very much at all is the death of uh, Justice Antonin Scalia in the early year, uh, months of 2016. Uh, so Justice Scalia, of course, was the primary proponent of the Chevron Doctrine, uh, and he continued to be so uh, almost uh, up until his death. There were some intimations in one opinion in 2015 that maybe he was beginning to have second thoughts about the Chevron Doctrine, but uh, he never really renounced it. So I think while he was alive, uh, and had this enor enormous influence on uh, conservative judges and thinkers, uh, there was a reluctance to launch a full-scale attack on Chevron. During that later years of his life, there was a kind of a proxy war about this um, in which uh, various c uh, commentators and judges denounced the doctrine uh, called the Auer, A-U-E-R, or Seminole Rock Doctrine, which requires courts to defer to agency interpretations of their own regulations. 
And that crusade was, I think, a kind of a proxy or warm-up fight for the attack on Chevron. Uh, uh, and it ultimately succeeded uh, in a case called Kaiser versus Wilkie, uh, in which the court reformulated that doctrine in, in a much more uh, multifactorial uh, fashion. Uh, but, but I think as long as Justice Scalia was alive, there was some kind of a uh, against full-scale assaults on Chevron. Once he was dead, then all the uh, uh, knives came out. Um, a second factor which I think is important is that in 2013, uh, Justice Scalia uh, was able to uh, write the opinion for the court in what I, I regard as the most extravagant Chevron opinion that was rendered. It was called City of Arlington versus Federal Communications Commission, um, which basically held that if there's an ambiguity about the scope of an agency's authority or, or its jurisdiction, courts have to apply Chevron and have to defer to agencies about the determination of the scope of their own authority. Um, uh, so uh, this was, again, uh, part of Justice Scalia's rather consistent position, a very uh, uh, aggressive and, and broad construction of Chevron. But it split the conservative camp. Chief Justice Roberts wrote a very vigorous dissent, joined by Justices Kennedy and Alito. Uh, and after that decision in 2013, I think uh, uh, the conservative, uh, the sort of united front supporting Chevron collapsed. Um, and I think uh, the idea that somehow courts should defer to agencies about the scope, scope of their authority did not sit well with uh, traditional uh, thinkers that sort of uh, uh, support uh, conventional ideas about separation of powers and legislative supremacy and so forth. So what happens in between the rise and the fall? Well, a lot happens. That's why I wrote a whole book. Uh, the general picture, and I don't purport to go into the details, but the general picture is that doctrine was expanding until about the year 2000. The court was extending it to different areas of law in bits and pieces. Labor law, which had a very strong tradition of its own deference doctrine, uh, was taken over by the Chevron doctrine. Tax law was eventually taken over by the Chevron doctrine. Immigration law uh, was taken over by the Chevron doctrine and so forth. Um, uh, so there's a period of expansion up to about 2000. After that time, uh, then the qualifications start entering into the picture. And so uh, the Chevron doctrine becomes uh, more and more subject to various exceptions and, 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 and uh, caveats uh, and so forth. And the doctrine becomes certainly much more complex than it was originally. Um, the um, uh, the biggest move or the biggest change, I think, occurred in 2001 when the court uh, was faced with the problem that it had, it had recognized two deference doctrines, the, the Skidmore Doctrine, which dates from the 1940s, which basically is a multifactorial test that asks whether or not the agency's interpretation is persuasive, and the Chevron Doctrine, which seems to require a court to refer to agencies when these two steps are satisfied. So the court was faced with the necessity of deciding when one doctrine applies and the other one applies. And in a case called United States versus Meade Corporation, uh, the court, uh, by, in an eight to one decision uh, authored by Justice Souter, uh, said that the distinction uh, turns on whether or not the agency is acting with the quote, force of law, close quote, uh, when it in, renders its interpretation. If the agency has been given that authority by Congress and exercises its interpretation in the uses that authority in interpreting the statute. Chevron applies, but if, uh, if, those, if that condition, the force of law condition, is not satisfied, then it, uh, Skidmore applies. So Skidmore becomes sort of a general default uh, rule, and Chevron becomes somewhat exceptional. Justice Scalia wrote an over-the-top vitriolic dissent, uh, saying uh, you've ruined the Chevron doctrine. It's become uh, too complicated for anybody to understand. I think he was right about that, in a sense. Uh, uh, but the court was unmoved. Um, uh, and so uh, after the Meade decision, you had really uh, three steps, not two. The first step, uh, so-called step zero, to ask whether or not the agency is acting uh, with the force of law, and then the two other steps of Chevron. So that becomes much more complicated, and, and the, the, the opinion in Meade was not particularly clear, and so there was a lot of disagreement about what exactly it meant. Other problems emerged. Uh, preemption cases uh, became uh, salient, and there were questions about how much deference courts should give to agencies in cases involving preemption of state law, preemption of tort law in particular was controversial, but also banking law. Uh, 
Um, and the court in those cases when, uh, was unable to reach a, a consistent uh, conclusion as to how Chevron factors into preemption, which is a federalism question as well as a statutory interpretation question. Other qu case, cases arose involving constitutional rights. What if there's a First Amendment claim? What if there's a religion claim? Um, in addition to the uh, agency interpretation, how do, how do we factor constitutional avoidance doctrines into uh, the Chevron doctrine? So there's a host of complexities that start emerging uh, after this, this midpoint. Um, and so uh, the one thing you can say, I think, with confidence is that the Chevron doctrine, which originally was appealing to agency lawyers and lower courts because of its simplicity, uh, becomes uh, something other than, it becomes very complex. It becomes something of a, uh, it was characterized in one oral argument by uh, Solicitor General Verrilli as uh, the internal revenue code of administrative law. You had all these different uh, nooks and crannies and, and exceptions and, and decisional trees and so forth. Um, so I think uh, you could say this is a vindication of the early critics that said that Chevron was too simplistic. It couldn't accommodate all these variables. You could also say it was a vindication of Justice Scalia, who argued consistently that Chevron should sweep everything else aside and should become the single metric uh, by which we uh, consider agency interpretations. So the second half of my subtitle is called The Future of the Administrative State. Um, and I do think that Chevron, uh, it may not have had a direct effect on, on the uh, size and scope of the administrative state, but it certainly fed into uh, the, the ideological debates about the administrative state. Uh, 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 various political scientists tried to measure the effect of Chevron in terms of agency win rates, and, and the answer seems to be it had some effect, but not a huge effect on agencies prevailing in court. Um, but I think it certainly had a major impact on the way we think about agencies uh, uh, under a system of separation of powers. Um, Chevron, the, the message of Chevron toward the end of the opinion, certainly, and the, the distinction between law and policy that sort of pervades the early part as well, um, is that um, uh, if, if there's a clear legal answer, then of course courts have to enforce the law. That's what courts are designed to do. But if there's not a clear answer, if it's a, a matter of balancing different policy considerations, uh, agencies are clearly preferred, the preferred institution for filling these gaps and resolving these ambiguities. Um, Agencies have greater expertise, they understand the statutory scheme uh, more than courts do, and they are uh, accountable to the president who's elected by all the people, whereas courts, of course, are not. So uh, this idea that somehow agencies are preferred uh, policymakers, certainly vis-a-vis -vis courts, uh, gives uh, the administrative agencies a boost, and also uh, it sort of transfers, at least symbolically, power from Congress, Congress previously being considered the sole organ of policy making. Uh, now Congress is considered to be, uh, have a co-equal policy making branch, the administrative state, uh, that uh, is lar entitled to make policy uh, when Congress doesn't speak uh, sufficiently clearly. Uh, and City of Arlington, of course, takes this to the limit uh, by saying that if Congress wants to confine uh, the uh, scope of authority of agencies or limit their authority, it has to speak clearly uh, in order to achieve that result. If it speaks uh, unclearly, uh, ambiguously, leaves a gap and so forth, and the agencies can take the bit in their teeth and run with it and resolve uh, the ambiguities about their own authority. Um, so that, I think, was an important boost uh, symbolically and rhetorically to the administrative state and helps explain why People that are fond of the original tripartite structure, uh, typically more conservative types, um, are now a dead set against uh, the Chevron doctrine. They see it as sort of facilitating this growth of the so-called deep state. Um, uh, I think um, the, uh, I take issue with this. I, I think that the, um, with Chevron on this ground, uh, certainly with the city of Arlington, I don't, I'm, I, as Jonathan knows, I'm no fan of city of Arlington. Uh, and I filed a brief in the case on behalf of the state governor saying this. But the um, my argument I make in the book is that really uh, courts under separation of powers, given the principle of legislative supremacy, given the premise that only Congress can create agencies, only Congress can decide the limits on agency authority or the extent of agency authority, courts really have to decide in every case what the agency's authority is if it's contested. 
uh, and they have to do so in the exercise of independent judgment, trying to uh, figure out as best they can what Congress's intent was uh, with respect to what this agency is going to do. If the court concludes the agency is acting within the scope of its authority, then yes, I think the court should defer to the agency uh, in resolving ambiguities and gaps. But I think it's imperative that courts uh, decide the scope of agency authority if, if we're going to retain this principle that Congress has exclusive power to uh, act as the, the decider who decides who decides, if you will, in, in, in our modern uh, system of government. Um, the, um, uh, that, that, uh, so I, I disagree with Arlington, I disagree with the court, and my book sort of proposes that the court should re revise the Chevron Doctrine in order to make this question of the scope of agency authority uh, the first thing that's considered uh, in these review cases. Um, now, I think the current Supreme Court sort of agrees with me about this. Um, certainly, I think they agree with the principle that Congress is the primary uh, agent of policy and legal change, and that Congress has exclusive authority to create agencies and decide uh, what their limits are. Uh, and the court took a step, I think, towards recognizing this idea last term in uh, creating something which is now called the major question doctrine. So uh, particularly in a case called West of Virginia versus EPA, uh, uh, the court uh, uh, announced that henceforth, um, uh, when an agency uh, renders a kind of unanticipated decision uh, resolving an ambiguity in its statute that it enforces in such a way as to uh, uh, tackle or resolve a major question of uh, political and economic significance, uh, the courts will invalidate the agency interpretation unless the agency can point to uh, clear authorization from Congress uh, to make uh, this kind of interpretation. So one way to think about this major questions doctrine uh, is, which didn't come out of the blue, the court you know, was sort of patching together uh, bits and pieces from earlier decisions that had made some reference to the importance of uh, that, that co Congress cannot be assumed to have al allowed agencies to make these major decisions. But one way to think about the major questions doctrine is it sort of reverses the Chevron doctrine. So the Chevron doctrine says that if there's an ambiguity in a statute which really amounts to a policy question, uh, then as long as Congress has not clearly uh, spoken about this question, the agency gets to decide it, courts have to defer to the agency. Uh, the major questions doctrine says that if there's an ambiguity in a statute, uh, and, uh, the, and the agency resolves it, and it's a major question of policy, uh, then the agency does not get to resolve it unless Congress has clearly said that they can. So instead of uh, there being a clear statement in favor of, uh, or a non-clear statement doctrine being in favor of agency authority, there's now a clear statement that limits agency authority. Um, and so we have a kind of inverted Chevron doctrine uh, that was announced at the tail end of the last term, most prominently in this West Virginia case. Lots of questions about this. I was very anxious, of course, leading up to this by thinking that, well, the court's going to overrule Chevron. My book is going to be uh, cons consigned to the <laughs> consigned to the sort of scrap heap or whatever happens to books uh, after they're worthless. But uh, curiously enough, the court said not a word about Chevron uh, in the West Virginia case. Indeed, they didn't say they practically didn't say a word about Chevron the entire term last term. And this builds on a tradition uh, starting in 2016, the last time the court applied the Chevron Doctrine, that the court pretends or, or at least behaves as if the Chevron Doctrine does not exist. Well, it does exist. It's been applied by the court in over 100 cases itself. The lower courts still apply Chevron fairly routinely. Uh, I'm sure lower court judges, agency lawyers, practicing lawyers that appear before agencies would like very much to know uh, what uh, this major questions doctrine means for the Chevron doctrine, but the Supreme Court is uh, as studiously silent uh, about that uh, this last term. There were some cases this last term where the oral argument was uh, dominated by questions about what, should we overrule Chevron, what should replace it, and so forth. But when the opinions come out, there's nothing was said about this at all. So something's going on there which is interesting. Um, I, I think there are two possibilities. One is that uh, the, the court has not reached any kind of consensus that five of the justices can agree upon as to what to do about Chevron. Um, the major questions doctrine seems to be a little carve out from Chevron uh, for these uh, questions of economic and political significance, but they can't decide what to do about Chevron. That's one possibility. They're waiting for some kind of enlightenment or consensus to emerge. Uh, 
uh, and then they'll tell us uh, about the future of the Chevron Doctrine. The other possibility is that the court has implicitly decided to re overturn Chevron, uh, repeal it, or, 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 or overrule it, uh, but they can't decide how to do that uh, without encountering massive embarrassment, given that they applied the Chevron Doctrine in 100 cases between 1986 and 2016, uh, and they rebuked lower courts on, uh, repeatedly for failing to apply the Chevron Doctrine. It would seem to be um, a, a, a very large task for the court to explain how, oh dear, we got it all wrong uh, for 100, in 100 cases, and now we've seen the light. So uh, one of those two or the combination of two things seems to be going on. The court is still at sea. My book is still somewhat relevant um, <laughs> uh, until the court is, uh, decides what to do about this. I'm not a fan of the major questions doctrine. I think uh, it's very ambiguous as to what is a major question. I think that the, uh, in theory, the que it sounds nice. It sounds like, well, there are these major questions of political and economic significance that Congress has to decide. And sort of minor questions can be decided by the agency. The reality is, is that if the court decides itself that it's a major question, it's the court that's deciding uh, the policy question. Not, and, and Chevron tells us, teaches us, that courts are the least best entity to resolve these conflicting policy questions uh, as between Congress agencies and courts. Um, and and um, the ambiguities are unbelievable uh, about what this uh, actually means. Uh, in practice, and so I think what you're likely to have in the future is more confusion uh, in the lower courts about what to do about this uh, situation, and the Supreme Court does not have the capacity to sort out all of the circuit conflicts that are inevitably going to result from this latest innovation uh, by the court. Um, anyway, that's a brief overview of things, and I'd be more than happy to take any and all questions that you have. Thank you, Tom. Um, if folks have questions, uh, please raise your hand. We have a microphone that's going to go around, and there are folks watching um, uh, through the internet. We want to make sure that they can hear the question. I'm going to uh, take the liberty of asking the first question, yeah. um, which the moderator tends to do. And um, I was wondering what you would make of the hypothesis that one, one thing that may explain the Supreme Court's behavior since 2016 um, is taking seriously the court's own admonition and the admonition of and Judge Kavanaugh on some of his writings prior to being a justice and uh, one of Justice Kennedy's last opinions on the court, that part of the problem has been that lower courts did not take step one seriously and did not engage in the sort of full-throated statutory interpretation that they are expected to do, something that, that Justice Kagan also emphasized is necessary in her um, Kaisor opinion, and that perhaps what the court's been doing since 2016 is merely showing lower courts how, how to interpret statutes, and have they just been lucky that there hasn't been a truly ambiguous statute that's reached them in that period of time? Great. Um, I, I do think that there is, I think the Kennedy uh, comment is warranted. I do think that there are uh, probably numerous cases in the lower courts uh, where uh, courts encounter uh, naughty questions uh, decided by agencies. Uh, which are embedded in some kind of super complicated statutory scheme, uh, which is alien to the, the court. Uh, and the, what the Chevron Doctrine seems to mean to some of these judges is that they can sort of zero in on the particular phrase or clause which is contested. And then they can pronounce it either clear or ambiguous. Uh, and then, if, uh, and then that everything else follows from that. If it's clear, then they enforce it uh, the way they think it should be read. If it's ambiguous, then they uh, defer to the agency and so forth. And so this. This, um, I think Chevron, its simplicity and its uh, uh, simple two steps and so forth has probably created uh, an opportunity for lazy judging by lower courts. Uh, I, I once did a take home exam in a, in a for students that uh, used a First Circuit decision involving interstate truck drivers. Uh, there's a federal statute that says that truck drivers who are convicted of DUI or are in an accident in which there is uh, bodily injury uh, can have this posted on a website that the Department of Transportation maintains so that future employers can s sort of make an assessment as to whether to hire them. The Department of Transportation decided this didn't go far enough and that they would post on the website every moving violation that truck drivers got. 
They filed a, a lawsuit saying, wait a minute, this is not what the statute says. First Circuit says, oh, it's ambiguous. You know, Chevron applies. We think this is reasonable. So the truck drivers are, are you know, uh, are out of luck. Uh, that's, a little, that's a bunch of little people who are being, you know, their, their statutory rights are being ignored based on a kind of flip analysis of Chevron. So I think that I think that's just one case that comes to mind. But I think this is a problem. Um, and I think major questions doesn't solve this because I don't think the Supreme Court would declare this to be a major question of political and economic significance, but the truck drivers of the world are, have no way of getting their rights vindicated. I do think that the, what's been happening since 2016, and it's very crystal clear in this last term, is that the court, both liberal justices and conservative justices, have decided these cases de novo. Uh, there's no mention of the agency's interpretation. There's no mention of Chevron. Uh, the, whoever gets assigned the case uh, rolls up their sleeves and writes a, a very uh, elaborate decision utilizing all the canons of interpretation and everything else uh, and either decides that the agency is right or the agency is wrong. It's sort of random in one way or the other. But maybe this is an object lesson that they're providing to the lower courts. I, I'm not sure about that. Um, uh, the problem with that is, is one of uh, decisional capacity. So. The Supreme Court has a very discretionary docket, as you all know. It sometimes decides as few as 56 cases a year. I think it's usually more typically 70 or 75. Um, but the court you know, has the luxury when it gets an agency decision about, say, Medicare reimbursement questions or something like that. They, they have enough decisional capacity to really dig into this. Uh, they have four law clerks. They have you know, a great library and so on and so forth. Uh, and so they can uh, do a full-scale, detailed statutory construction job on these agency decisions. The lower court judges don't have that luxury. They have thousands of cases on their docket. And these, these statutory cases come up which are you know, completely incomprehensible to them and so forth. So I think part of what the problem is right now is that you have a very s dissimilar situation between the Supreme Court and the lower courts. And I think the Supreme Court has sort of lost sight of the fact that it's not just simply deciding these cases itself. It's also you know, instructing lower court judges how to decide these cases. And lower court judges are in a very different set of circumstances than they are in terms of being able to do this. So I don't think that's a sustainable uh, approach in the long run to say that federal judges should, you know, expend weeks and weeks with multiple law clerks uh, uh, excavating the details of Medicare uh, statutes to see what the correct answer is. That's right. Can we talk a little bit about the relationship between major questions and non-delegation, which yeah, seems yeah, sure. to be yeah. lurking? Um, I mean, the non-delegation doctrine basically says that Congress can't can't delegate its powers, and it's supposed to make these big these big policy decisions. Right. Um, and the major questions doctrine seems to be saying something along the same lines, but the court doesn't seem to be talking about non-delegation in the major questions cases, and it doesn't. At least not explicitly, um, and in the it, it, when they talk about non-delegation in some of the separate opinions, you don't see a lot of the question about major questions, but there does seem to be some connection. Yeah, good question. Um, yes, uh, I think uh, I think there is a clear connection between major questions and non-delegation. Uh, uh, as you are w undoubtedly aware, uh, one of the justices on the court, uh, Justice Gorsuch, has been an aggressive proponent of reviving the non-delegation doctrine. Uh, um, it, curiously enough, it's not an originalist argument because there's not any originalist uh, sources that would suggest that the framers had some kind of rigorous non-delegation doctrine in mind. It's an, it's an argument that we should go back to the law as it existed in 1825 in Wayman versus Southard. Uh, uh, and, and, and that should be the non-delegation doctrine, not the doctrine that emerges out of Hampton, you know, uh, versus J.W. J.W. Hampton case that says you have to have an intelligible principle uh, 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 in order to have it be sustained against the non-delegation challenge. Uh, but anyway, Gorsuch is very uh, on, on board for this, and he's gotten a number of other justices to make sympathetic noises about this. Uh, I think what has happened, what happened in West Virginia in particular, but also in the OSHA case that preceded it, uh, that was the vaccination or mandatory testing uh, uh, order that OSHA issued, uh, is that um, Justice Gorsuch made signals that he uh, was willing to go with major questions as sort of a first step toward reviving the non-delegation doctrine. And uh, Justice Roberts, I, this is my pop psychology about this, uh, 
Justice Roberts was still smarting from his loss in City of Arlington versus FCC about courts, you know, having independent authority over the scope of agency authority. And Roberts was able to figure out that he could write this major questions doctrine into the law that would combine the Gorsuch wing with his own uh, thoughts about this uh, and get a majority uh, opinion uh, that way, which he did. Um, uh, I don't think, I think there's a sort of logical tension between the major questions doctrine and the non-delegation doctrine. The non-delegation doctrine says that Congress cannot delegate certain powers uh, to anybody, courts, agencies, the president, and so forth, uh, because those questions are only for Congress to decide itself. The major questions doctrine says that Congress can delegate major questions of social and economic uh, significance as long as it does so clearly. So the major questions doctrine actually authorizes delegations uh, uh, outside of Congress as long as Congress speaks clearly. The non-delegation doctrine in its original form and as I assume it's still existing form in the mind of Justice Gorsuch, flatly prohibits those sorts of delegations, clear or unclear. So I think there's a problem there. Um, but I, th I think that the uh, West Virginia uh, uh, move uh, sort of reflects uh, Robert's uh, ability to knit together different uh, factions among the conservatives in support of this major questions idea. Two questions. Uh, Victor, yeah. Yeah, I'm speaking to the microphone real quick. Sorry, I'm sure you're on the line. Thank you. Um, so, two things actually. Responding to just what, what you just said, um, can you comment on the fact that the, the court has actually never found a major question delegation that it approves, right? It's never said this is a major question and it's fine. Yeah, um, and I'm holding my breath for that to happen. Yeah, um, and I, I agree, I'm not fond of the major questions doctrine because it seems like there's so much, it's just in the judge's decision. But is one way to understand it, even as a flip of Chevron, that both could be looked at as what Congress intended? That at least originally in Chevron, the theory was, well, we're going to have this legal fiction that Congress would have intended if it's ambiguous for the agency to fill that in, not the courts. And similarly, in major questions, um, you know, Congress did not intend to do this. So if you took it all back to intent, would that make them a little bit more consistent? Yeah, good. Uh, I like that question. Um, I mean, I think if you envision the relationship between Congress and the courts and the agencies uh, in a sort of 19th century sense, where Congress is the, I know Woodrow Wilson was, wrote this book about congressional government, you know, Congress dominates everything. The framers actually thought Congress would dominate everything. So Congress is really on, on the case and they're constantly legislating to say overturn judicial decisions, overturn agency decisions clarify you know, when, when uh, ambiguities have been exploited in ways that they don't intend. Uh, that works great, that's fine. Uh, the problem is that's not the world we're living in. The world we're living in, as you're all aware, is one in which Congress uh, is a great deal of difficulty doing much of anything. Uh, um, it, it does more than we think. I mean, I think the recent uh, congressional term actually was uh, filled with some fairly significant accomplishments, but in, in compared to the amount of stuff that the federal government's doing uh, with all the agencies uh, and all the decision making that's occurring and so forth, Congress does not have the decisional capacity to interact and to respond to these sorts of decisions. And so for the Supreme Court to say that, well, this is a major question, and it's really well, Congress has to decide this and we're waiting for Congress to produce a clear authorization. Uh, well, chances are it's not gonna happen. I mean, one of the factors that is mentioned as, as uh, as relevant to whether it's a major question, this is particularly highlighted in the Gorsuch concurrence, but also I think uh, uh, it's mentioned by Chief Justice Roberts in his opinion for the court, is whether or not Congress has, has attempted to legislate and failed to legislate on the particular question. So if Congress has failed to legislate on the question, think climate change, for example, right? Um, uh, saying that this is a major question that requires clear authorization of Congress means that it's not gonna happen. You know, Congress is not gonna be able to, <laughs> overcome whatever deadlock occurred that, that led to it being a major question under this one criterion in the first place. Uh, and so you're not gonna get any answers at all. Now maybe some people would be fine with that, you know, uh, this is sort of a step toward a more minimalist government and, and so forth, libertarians might like this. Uh, people that think that some of these problems uh, require solutions, uh, 
uh, come what may, I mean, a lot of climate change people are very aggressive about this and think that, you know, if Congress can't do it, then somebody else has got to do it for us. Or immigration would be another example uh, where a lot of people think something needs to be done. So I, I just think that um, uh, in, a, in an idealized world, when there's a continual interaction between the legislature and the executive and the courts, uh, these doctrines of clear intent or, non, or, or the opposite would make some sense. It might make a lot of sense, uh, but we don't live in that world. This has really been fascinating to listen to. Thank you very much. Um, a couple of comments and questions. One is you refer to you know, ambiguity in a particular section of text. But often, I thought, ambiguity is, a, is, for instance, in the relationship between one portion of text and the rest of the structure of the law. Um, so it's not as easy to talk about, uh, to, to define, and an obvious case would be um, you know, the, the, author the authority to, uh, to uh, have tax credits calculated right, uh, by, by a... Uh, Health exchange, yeah, okay, um, right. and uh, obviously, system. obviously, yeah, we refer to 2015, and 2015 is when that case comes down, and uh, and Chief Justice Roberts says uh, we're not going to do Chevron deference on this case. This is this is too important. This is essentially a a, a major question that the court has to decide. Right. Uh, the interesting thing about that case is. Can we really say the issue is whether the agency can decide? Uh, because the IRS was going to allow uh, tax credits to be calculated by, by, the, uh, by, by the authority, or it wasn't going to, I mean, that, that, yeah, that wasn't an exchange not, not established directly by a state, or it wasn't. It didn't have a choice about deciding. To make this a question of whether they can decide is absurd. They had to decide something. You know, so, somebody had to do it. So that's one comment. And the second is that it seems to me that the, the stakes are frequently to, uh, uh, phrased in terms of the future of the administrative state. And obviously the non-delegation doctrine is an attempt to uh, cripple the administrative state by saying that you do not have the authority to have agencies do things that nobody in their right mind thinks a Congress could do in terms of the, the reason we have all this delegation and there's a ton of delegation, is the laws are written as the secretary shall figure something out, right? And that's because you can't really have Congress do that. Uh, on the other hand, you know, Chevron didn't happen until 1984. We built the whole administrative state. Uh, Ted Lowy wrote about how terrible it was that the interest groups, you know, you know, had their relationships with the agencies and all that kind of stuff long before 1984. So the question is, if getting rid of Chevron means going back to 1983, is that a big deal? Or are we really talking about something other than getting rid of Chevron? We're really talking about some version of the non-delegation doctrine or something like that, but going well beyond getting rid of Chevron. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both of those are great questions. Now, uh, King versus Burwell is a case you alluded to that uh, various people were responsible for bringing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, the, the Affordable Care Act uh, in buried in some, you know, a deep provision. It was a very long statute. It was, it was produced in haste, right? The, the, the control of the Senate had flipped, and so the House had to pass the Senate bill without scrubbing it and so forth. And so that unsurprisingly, there were various glitches in the statute, including a provision that said that tax credits were available only on exchanges established by a state, and the federal exchanges were not established by states. So that gave rise to that litigation. Now, why did Roberts decide not to apply Chevron in that case? That's an interesting question. Um, maybe, maybe he was reacting still to uh, Arlington, which had been decided shortly before that, uh, uh, and was thinking about you know, planting the seeds of this major questions doctrine as a way of partially reversing what happened in Arlington. That, you know, the agencies are in charge of determining the scope of their authority, uh, not courts. Uh, that's speculation, obviously. Um, uh, another possibility is that Roberts felt that if you chevronized uh, the question, he did say it was ambiguous, which I don't agree with. I think it was unambiguous, but uh, 
I think it was a, it was a drafting error myself. That's my interpretation. But anyway, if if it's in fact ambiguous, then Chevron should apply. And maybe maybe Roberts was uncomfortable with the idea that some future administration, the Republicans, of course, were trying to overturn the Affordable Care Act when that case was decided. If the Republicans gain control of both the House and Senate and the presidency, that they would then, you know. Uh, use this glitch as a way of essentially gutting the Affordable Care Act by limiting the credits to uh, state-created exchanges. Uh, and maybe he thought that was not a, he didn't like that prospect. I don't know, it's entirely speculative. But it was, a, it was an interesting move on his part. Um, because before that case, and, and even after that case, rhetoric about major questions was embedded in exercises of statutory interpretation as opposed to in King versus Burwell and in West Virginia, it sort of operates as a kind of a, uh, a clear statement rule that's applied before you engage in statutory interpretation. Let's go figure that. Um, uh, Chevron is not, I, I don't think Chevron's going to be overruled. You can't completely turn the clock back to 1983. I mean, too much has happened. There have been all these decisions. Um, uh, the Chevron Doctrine in its 30 plus year reign is going to change law, administrative law forever. Uh, you can't erase all of that stuff. So uh, I don't know what the court would put in its place. My best guess would be that it would just sort of modify the doctrine in certain ways uh, to give it maybe more uh, uh, oomph at step one or something like that. Um, but I don't think we can go back to 1983. You're absolutely right that the administrative state in 1983 was filled with all sorts of provisions. Uh, uh, that would flunk the Gorsuch version of the non-delegation doctrine. The Federal Trade Commission in 1914 is authorized to adjudicate unfair methods of competition. Okay, does that is that clear? Is that a clear delegation of authority? Uh, you know what the heck does that mean? Uh, and all sorts of other delegations uh, had happened that spoke of just and reasonable rates and, and so on and so forth. Very very general propositions. Uh, uh, you know, one hates to make bold predictions, but I don't think the court is going to overrule the administrative state. We have time for one last question. So as a practical litigation matter, if you're challenging a sign, an agency, particularly a scientific agency's decision, um, Peter Drucker, you know, the famous management consultant, wrote in 1979, he said, government science is now often determined by what is politically fashionable and value judgments, rather than uh, which have no, in his words, the reverse of any criteria one could possibly call scientific. Now that suggests to me that you don't, you challenge the assumption of the scientific expertise of the agency as a factual matter in litigation. What do you think? Um. Well, I think that is fair game. Uh, it usually is done under the rubric of arbitrary and capricious decision making rather than statutory interpretation. Uh, uh, but I, I, absolutely, I mean, I, you know, you can't have sort of motivated decision making by agencies driven by politics, uh, uh, which corrupts the science uh, that supposedly is being invoked in support of these decisions. Um, uh, and it's a very real problem for us. I mean, the whole COVID uh, experience, I think, highlighted this to the nth degree. Uh, um, you know, uh, I think p my own view is that part of the problem uh, that we had with COVID was that the, the scientists were sort of looking at this through a very a public health lens, you know, uh, rather narrowly. Uh, uh, and you had bigger questions of benefits and costs that implicated things besides health concerns, employment, schooling, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, we really needed to have a more kind of honest and open uh, uh, set of government deliberations about how to balance these factors than we did, uh, rather than sort of people hurling imprecations at each other about follow the science or don't follow the science, or the science is junk, or the science is uh, beyond reproach, and so on and so forth. But you're, you're, you're right, I think that uh, it would be uh, a big mistake to simply defer to agency scientists without some scrutiny as to how it fits into the larger decision making that they're engaged in. We're going to have to uh, call it there. Um, we have the reception uh, around on the other side of this wall. There are also books there. I know Tom will be happy to sign any books uh, as well. Um, so please join us at the reception. Please join me in thanking Tom for tonight.